Well, it's lovely to see so many folk here this morning. I thought that maybe because of the long weekend, some people would be away, but I also thought maybe when they saw the topic of the message, that would scare them off. And that is how to become holy. Shall we just bow in a moment of prayer? Father, we just thank you for this time of worship we've had, that we could gather around your table, that we could just think again of this amazing sacrifice that you were willing to make so that we can be cleansed and forgiven. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the songs we could sing and just lift our hearts in praise to you. We thank you for your presence. And Lord, we just ask that as we contemplate your word, that you will speak to us and make these truths real to us. We ask it for your name's sake. Amen. It's a scary topic, but the Lord's primary purpose for our lives is very simple. It's to become holy. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, God's will is for you to be holy. I mean, what's about that that we don't understand? It is actually to become more like Jesus. In Romans 8.29, we read that God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. Now, I don't know about you, but that just overwhelms me that God would want a flawed person like me to become like his son. And this command to be holy is not for some group of super Christians, which, by the way, don't exist. It's for all of us. But then on the other hand, if you think about it, the desire of every person, uh, every parent is for that their children should follow in their footsteps, not necessarily career-wise, but certainly in terms of values. And God's holiness to become more like him should be our overriding passion. Some time ago, I was at a four-way stop street. It was my turn to go, and another car went ahead of me and turned in front of me. And I flashed my lights at him. And he greeted me, waved at me with one finger. <laughs> and just then, I just sensed the Lord speak to me and says, I wouldn't have done that. I said, but Lord, it was my turn. He said, yes, but this morning you asked that I should make you more like me. Maybe the way you behave in traffic is a good place to start. Ouch. <laughs> and I can tell you, I've never since flashed my lights at another motorist. <laughs> but if we make... Holiness, our goal in life, everything else will fall into place. Our marriage, our parenting, our work, our ministry. Now, let me explain to you just an important understanding of, of, a, of a biblical truth, and that is the difference between position and practice. Did you know that every believer is holy? In Hebrews 10 verse 10, it says, By that will, by God's will, we have been have been made holy. It's done, it's done and dusted through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We have been made holy. Yet, four verses later we read that every believer is being made holy. Because Hebrews 10, 14, that's just only four verses later, says, for by that one offering he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. So, are we holy, or are we being made holy? And the answer is, yes. <laughs> Both are true. And becoming holy is simply the process of becoming what we already are. And I've used this example many times, forgive me for using it again. But if King Charles and Prince William were to die today in some accident... Little 11-year-old George would be crowned King of Britain. They would put a crown on his head. They would sing the national anthem, God save the king, and think of George. But he would not function as a king. The rules say that in such an event, a regent would be appointed in his place and for the next, until he reaches the age of 21. So for the next 10 years, George would go through the process of becoming in practice what he already is in position. And that really is a good summary of the Christian life, isn't it? The process of becoming in practice, becoming holy in practice, what we already are in position. And it's this practical holiness that I want to focus on this morning. And it's not an option. It's a command. 1 Peter 1.15 says, You must be holy in everything you do. 
Just as God who chose you is holy, for the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Now let's face it, that is a scary assignment. So what do we mean by a person who's holy? What are the characteristics of a holy life? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not some monk in a monastery sitting there doing nothing else but singing hymns. It's not a recluse sitting on a mountain contemplating his navel. Nor is it a full-time minister. <laughs> well, I always used to think, well, they have all the time to, you know, be holy and things like that. It's not a Christian who says, well, I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't swear. And it's not that. That's not holiness. Nor is it a pious person, like the person that I knew some years ago, when you say, how are you? He says, I'm kept by the grace of the Lord. <laughs> Now, it is true that we are kept by the grace of the Lord, but to say it in that way, do you understand? It's this pious, and by the way, the way he treated his family left a lot to be desired, so that's just by the way. So, come on, what are the characters? What does a holy person look like? Well, we find a good description in Galatians 5, verse 22. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's a holy person. That's what it means to be more like the Lord Jesus. And will you note, they're all very positive attributes. And they are very practical. Holiness is not some mystical experience where we are so heavenly minded that we are of no earthly use. So, God's purpose for us as His children is that we should become more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, and so on. Right, now comes a key question. Who is responsible for our holiness? Who's responsible for making us? How many of you think it's God's responsibility? Would you just raise your hand? Okay, that's three. How many of you think it's our responsibility? Okay, that's another two. And the rest of you have no clue, right? <laughs> or you're too scared to put up your hands in church. Well, I've got some wonderful good news for you. We are not responsible to become holy in practice. It's God's responsibility. He makes us holy. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23 we read, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. And if you and I think that we are responsible to make ourselves more holy, and I'm talking obviously when I say holy, in a practical way now, not in the positional way, but in a practical way, then eventually we give up in despair. We, every time we don't quite succeed, we say, oh, what's the use of trying? Oh, I'm never going to get it right. And we feel like a failure, and we settle for this mediocre Christian life. Two weeks ago, as I was preparing this particular message, I actually had a dream. I dreamt that in our passage we had a huge painting, which we don't actually, but I dreamt this. And that somehow I had blotched this painting. So I took a paintbrush, and with, I still remember it was black paint, bright yellow and bright green. And I started improving this painting. And then just my wife walked in and saw what I was doing, and fortunately I woke up. Now, I'm not into dreams, and I'm not into interpreting dreams, please. But somehow the Lord just reminded me and said, you know what, what you dreamt about trying to fix that painting is like what you're trying to do when you try and fix your own life. All you end up is making a mess. Leave it to the master artist to do. It's not your role. He is responsible, not us, for keeping us true to himself, 2 Corinthians 1.21 says, It is God who enables us, along with you, to stand firm in Christ. That's His responsibility. It's not ours. And we must stop striving to become better Christians. Isn't that terrible for me to say that? But please understand that, because all we end up is making a mess. For the first 12 years of my Christian life, I just struggled, and I always felt such a failure, and I always thought it was up to me. And then one morning, I blurted out a prayer that went something like this. Lord, this morning, and this, by the way, was in 1974. 
Lord, this morning I'm handing in my resignation. I am no longer willing to accept responsibility for my spiritual growth. Lord, I'm willing for you to change me, but if you don't change me, then I'm, you're stuck with me the way I am. And I didn't understand the scriptures the way I understood it now. But a bolt of lightning didn't strike me dead. I just had a wonderful burden roll of me. It was as if the Lord said, I've been waiting for 12 years for you to get to that point so you can get out of the way and stop trying to do my work. Now I can finally get started on you. And that was a milestone in my Christian life. That's when my spiritual growth started, when I actually stopped trying. Now, of course, that begs the question, if God is responsible for our holiness then what is the believer's responsibility? I mean, do we have any responsibility? Yes. It is simply obedience to his command. 1 Peter 1 verse 2 says, We have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, please note, chosen for the obedience to Jesus Christ. That's what he chose us for. Now, please understand, God does not have this ego need to be obeyed. Obedience is for our benefit, not his. Just like any parent knows that a child's obedience is for their benefit. And if we do not obey him, please note, we simply don't belong to him. It's as simple as that. 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4. We can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. But if someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. Wow, those are pretty strong words. But it's true. Now, when I say not obey, none of us will obey him perfectly. We're not talking about being perfect in our lifestyle. We're talking about as a way of life. That is the characteristic of every true believer. Now, another important distinction to understand is the difference between character and behavior. You see, God is responsible for what we are. He's responsible for our character. He shapes our character. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 10, By the grace of God, I am what I am. That, that's God's responsibility, His grace. And He makes us more loving. He makes us more gentle. He makes us more peaceful and patient and kind. We are responsible for what we do, our behavior. And it's a day-by-day -day obedience. The good news is we don't have to be obedient tomorrow, only today. But tomorrow morning when you wake up, it will be today. <laughs> Remember that. In Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, there's that obedience again, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. God works in us, and what he works in us, we work out. In other words, he gives us the desire, he gives us the ability. It's our choice what we do with it. And the wonderful thing is, we don't have to start looking around. Now, now what can I do for the Lord? Where, where can I do it? No. He will create the opportunities to obey Him. Ephesians 2.10, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. He planned for us as individuals. There are things God has planned for you, there's things God has planned for me to do. And we don't have to go looking for them. Now, these good things are expressed basically in two ways. First of all, through godly reactions. And secondly, through practical ministry. For example, if a taxi cuts in front of you and you're tempted to lose your cool, but you don't. That's a godly reaction. That honors the Lord. Or... If you have an opportunity to witness. You know, I always felt that as a Christian, I've got to witness to other people. I've got to tell them about the Lord. No! I just wait for him to create the opportunities. 
That's the wonderful freedom that we have. Oh, some years ago, I was on my way somewhere to Natal to, to speak at a seminar, and uh, on the little bus, you know, going towards the, the aeroplane, here's a chap who knew me, and apparently, hello, how's it, and how are you doing, and things like that, and it turned out I'd spoken at his company sometime, and we just chatted, and then when I got onto the plane, he ended up sitting next to me, and it was good to just chit-chat. I'm not there to have to witness to him. If the Lord wants me to speak to him, he'll open the way. So afterwards I said to him, listen, will you excuse me? I've got a sermon to prepare. And I pulled out my laptop. He said, Joshua, go ahead. But he started reading. And he started asking questions. And there was this, this most wonderful opportunity just to share with him the gospel when he was ready to hear for it. Well, I got off the plane. I've never seen him again. But um, I had a car and off I drove and just outside Durban. Those were in the days when the army boys were still hitchhiking. So I picked up an army boy. And I said, you can get a lift if you're willing to listen to a sermon. No, sure, he said. I mean, to get a lift, you'll do anything. <laughs> and I played him a tape of John MacArthur's sermon, <laughs> an hour sermon. <laughs> and when it came to an end, he said nothing. So I said, well, what did you think of that? He said, oh, no, very good, very good. Further, nothing, no questions. And I dropped him off a bit later. And as if the Lord said to me, you know, that first guy was ready to hear the gospel. That's why I put him next to you in the plane. This guy, you forced it on him. You've probably done more harm than good. And I came to learn through that, that it's not my responsibility. He has prepared good works for us to do. My prayer each morning is, Lord, make me sensitive to those opportunities that you give me. Either by way of godly reactions or practical ministry. Now, let me explain to you the framework of obedience. If we have a foundation and we want to build a concrete pillar, what do we have to do before we can pour the concrete? Are there any builders in the audience? No. You have to put up the shuttering. You can't just pour the concrete. You've got to build a frame. Usually it's a metal frame, sometimes wood. You know it looks like a pillar, but it's not the real article. And it's only when the frame is up that the concrete can be poured. When the concrete is set, then you can remove the frame. Now, when it comes to growing in holiness, when it comes to becoming more loving and joyful and things, God is the one who pours the concrete. He changes the character. He does the building. But he cannot do it unless we provide him with a framework. And that framework is obedience. You see, God can only change our character when we change our behavior. In Deuteronomy 28.9, the Lord said, If you obey, or Moses said, If you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you as his holy people as he swore he would do. You see what's required of us? Just obedience. And then he will establish us as his holy people. And we can pray as much as we like. We can pray for more love and we can pray for more patience and more gentleness. We will not wake up the next morning being more loving, more kind, more gentle, whatever it is we were praying for. We become holy through obedience, not through prayer. 1 Peter 1.22, now that you have purified yourselves, that word purify is exactly the same word as made holy. Now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth. And we are to take off, and we are to put on. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. It's, a, it's as simple as that. It's not a long, year-long struggle to change ourselves. In fact, even better, Romans 13, 14 says, Rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. It's not going to take you... If, if you have a problem with, te with anger... The Lord simply says, stop it. Put it off. And do you know that it takes, not years, but about six to eight weeks of consciously 
seeking to change and to obey in that area, and it becomes a habit. As little as that. It's not a case of struggling, it's a case of obedience. You know what the biggest problem is? Most times we don't want to. Oh. And I want to warn you that prayer only leads to opportunity for practicing. So be careful what you pray for. Some time ago, I was standing in a long queue at the post office. And I turned to the lady behind me and I said, I want to apologize for causing this long delay. She said, why? What did you have to do with it? I said, no, this morning I asked the Lord for more patience. He sent me here to practice it. (laughs) But that's the truth. You pray for more love. You're going to bump into somebody you don't like who has a need that you can do something about. I remember years ago, I just bought a new car. Oh, you know, excited. It was about a week old. And I had spoken at my Bible study at the university on thankfulness. Then went into town to do some business and had to stop rather suddenly at a traffic light, looked in my rearview mirror, and I saw the car coming. And it wasn't going to stop in time. And it smashed into my new car. You know what's the first thought? Will you still be thankful? You see, it's easy to be thankful when things go well. But to be thankful when things go wrong. So be careful what you pray for. An example of that was the early church. In Acts 4.29, they prayed and said, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. And you know what a chapter later, Peter and John were hauled before the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin. And this is what they said to these men who were warning them not to preach in the name of Jesus. Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. And the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. That's boldness, believe me, to tell the the, the Jewish leaders, you know, of the nation, to tell them that. Well, they prayed for boldness. God gave it to them. Be careful what you pray for. Now, developing the fruit of the Spirit then requires obedience on our part. And there's a command for every one of those fruits. For example, when it comes to love, 1 John 3, 18 says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. And years ago, I had a colleague at the university, and I heard via the, via the, via the grapevine that he had some, said some very negative and derogatory things about me. And then one day he fell ill and he had to go to hospital and the hospital was on my way home. And as I was driving home, I just, the Lord again in my mind said, why don't you go and visit him? I said, never, he's a louse. He said, well, there's a man with a need, needs a visit. Why don't you go and visit him? It's my choice. I either obey or I act on my feelings. And I visited him. He's still a louse. I mean... What about joy? Why don't people enjoy life? And by the way, the devotions that are starting next, uh, tomorrow, is on how to enjoy life. (laughs) But Philippians 4 says, always be full of joy in the Lord. And I say it again, rejoice. And the reason why many of us don't, are not by nature more joyful people is because we don't obey the Lord to rejoice. I worked in in the gold mines on the East Rand some years ago, and I hated the job. I had to get up early in the morning and drive, and I still remember on the road to the, the R21, suddenly again, you know the Lord speaks in these impressions on the mind, and he said, do you, do you believe that it's my will that, this, that, that, that you're in this job? I said, yes, Lord. But I think, yes, yes, it is your will that I should be in this job. And like a sh- pulled out of the blue, it says, then why are you bitching about doing my will? Ouch. And I had to confess that. And I started rejoicing in the Lord. Yes, the job didn't change all that much, but that ah, disappeared. And I just became by nature a more joyful person. Why do people not have peace? I'm so worried, so anxious. Why? Well, Philippians 4 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything and tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, 
which exceeds anything we can understand, His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And when we do not experience peace, and the opposite of peace is anxiety and worry and anxiousness, it's because we don't obey. What about patience? Brothers and sisters, we urge you, be patient with everyone. And so the next time you're stuck in a traffic jam, say, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to practice patience. Rather than saying, oh, look at this traffic again. What about kindness? Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And I suddenly realized how often I walk past the invisible people in our society. You know who they are? They're the cleaners in the malls, the car guards, the, the, the people on duty. And I started practicing kindness. I cannot tell you the results of that. For instance, we go to one of these booms, you know, that, that we go regularly where you have to put out your hand. And we started, it was the same guy always there. Got to know his name, started chatting to him, eventually ended up giving him one of my books. Now he wants to talk to me about it, about putting his, you know, believing in Christ. And, the, and I went and visited him, but the sad part was he said, sorry, but I cannot give up my belief in my ancestors and ancestor worship. And in that case, it was sad. But, but just the opportunity was there. And it started with just being kind. That's all. What about goodness? Do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourselves pure. Be a person of integrity. Transparent honesty, for example, when you re do your tax returns. Avoid immoral issues, whether it is pornography or whether it is telling white lies. Just avoid it. Just be pure in the way you behave. That's the choice we have. And we're not always going to get it right. But that's how we become by nature. How about faithfulness? Not quitting a ministry. Keeping appointments. For example, when you've committed yourself to a cell group, make an effort, make a sacrifice to attend, be part of that group. Being on time, returning phone calls, especially your missed calls. Keeping your word. Listen to Psalm 15 verse 4. Who may enter your presence or your holy hill? And a number of things were mentioned, but in verse 4 it says, those who keep their promises even when it hurts. There was a young soldier in World War I who was about to be sent overseas to the battlefront. He was a Christian. He went to a, a, a second-hand bookstore, and he bought a book of devotions. And he took it with him, and, and as he started reading, he found very interesting comments on the margin, notes and, and that somebody had obviously previous. And there was a lady's name and address on the front cover. So he took a chance and he wrote to her and she replied back and they started corresponding and literally fell in love by a correspondence. When he returned to England, they agreed that they would meet at a station. He would carry the book of devotion. She would carry a red rose. Can you imagine the anticipation as the train arrived and off stepped a beautiful young lady in a red dress and came walking towards him. But she did not have a rose in her hand. She didn't even glance at him. She walked right past him. And the next thing he saw, a frumpish middle-aged lady get off the train with a red rose in her hand. And he said, my first instinct was to run. And he said, no. I gave him my promise that I would meet her. This is the lady I've come to love. And so he went up and introduced himself to her, and she said, young man, I don't know what this is all about, but a young lady in a red dress asked me to carry this rose and to tell you <laughs> that if you introduced yourself to me, I should tell you she's waiting for you in the station's coffee shop. <laughs> and apparently that couple were married for over 60 years before one of them passed away. Keep your word. That's faithfulness. What about gentleness? Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. In other words, not aggressive, not pushy, not harsh, not quarrelsome. And self-control. 
Paul said, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. And whether that is self-control with our quiet time, self-control with our eating, self-control as far as losing our temper is concerned. Now, the argument is sometimes brought up, or the question is asked, is it not hypocrisy to act contrary to our feelings? I mean, you went and visited this guy in hospital, but you didn't like him. Isn't that hypocrisy? No, it's an act of obedience. For example, Matthew 5, 44 says, love your enemies. Come on, how can you love people who harm you, who defraud you, who speak badly of you, who, do you understand, those are the kind of enemies we have. How can you love people like that? Ah, oh, you don't have to love them by liking them. No, because Romans twelve twenty says, if, them, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to, feed, to eat, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Oh, that I can do for someone I don't like. Visit him in hospital. Oh, that I can do. It's not hypocrisy. It's obedience. Because if behaving contrary to our feelings is hypocrisy, I confess to you that most winter's mornings, I am a hypocrite. I get out of bed. And I don't want to. But you do it. You have to. A medical doctor from Natal years ago came to see me about his marriage that was falling apart. We spoke a long time, but at one stage I said to him, tell me, what loving things do you do for your wife? And I mentioned the number of things he could do. He said, no, I don't do any of them. Why not? He said, I don't feel like it. Well, what are feelings got to do with it? He said, well, no, then I would be a hypocrite. Oh, so you're telling me that if you do things contrary to how you feel, you're a hypocrite. Yes. And it's wonderful how the Lord just gives you examples. And I said, does it ever happen that a patient phones you at 3 o'clock in the morning, or the hospital phones you, and you have to get up and go and see a patient at 3 o'clock in the morning? Yes, he says, it happens sometimes. I said, I suppose you jump out of bed and you say, oh, what a wonderful opportunity to serve mankind. Do you think a doctor reacts that way at 3 o'clock in the morning? Let's ask Michael Lippert. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> but he goes. I said, you're a hypocrite. He said, no, I have to. I said, why? He says, I took an oath. Yeah, it's called the Hippocratic Oath. Sounds more to me like the Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> and I said, but there was a time when you stood in front of, in the Lord's presence, in, in, in the presence of friends and family on your wedding day, and you also took an oath. And you promised your bride that you would, be, you would love her till death you depart. That had no conditions attached. You want to ask me how to save your marriage? Just like you obey your medical oath, regardless of how you feel, go and obey your wedding oath, regardless of how you feel. I've lost touch with them, but as far as I know, they're still together, and that was over 19 years ago. You see, feelings should never govern our behavior. If Jesus had allowed his feelings to govern his behavior, you and I would be eternally lost. But you know that wonderful prayer he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Good. Would you like me to close now? What are the practical implications? And I've got three don'ts and three do's. Don't pray for what you already have, because the Christian already has everything. To pray for more love, more patience, more joy, it's a waste of time. By His divine power, says 2 Peter 1.3, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life, or if you like, for living a holy life. We've got all the resources. We have everything already. What we need to rather pray for is, Lord, make me sensitive to opportunities to practice those virtues. Second, don't, don't struggle to change your nature. Just come to rest. Practice what I call relaxed holiness. Hebrews 4.10 says, For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors. And when I do sin and I confess it, I simply say, Lord, that's typically me. 
I have no illusions about my basic nature. And then the third don't is, don't despair when you fall. Accept that you will not be perfect. Even the great apostle Paul, towards the end of his life, as he was writing from prison in Rome to the church in Philippi, he said, I don't mean to say that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. And if the apostle Paul had not yet reached perfect perfection, why must I despair when I am not perfect? Accept his forgiveness. 1 John 2, 1 says, Dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. That's the standard. That's the norm. Christians, don't sin. But then he adds, and I'm so grateful he does, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. And that's one advocate who has never, ever lost a case. And then, don't withdraw from him. Why did Jesus have to say to his disciples, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me? Even as the Father has loved Jesus, so Jesus loves us? Remain in my love. Why would Jesus say remain in my love? Because we are so quick when we sin or we do something wrong, we say, oh, the Lord doesn't love me anymore. Oh, no. And we withdraw from him. Don't do that. Well, three do's. Admit your own inability to change yourself. Because the desire to sin will always be there. Again, even the great Paul says, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I struggle with that. For many years in the early Christian life, in my Christian life, I used to pray, Lord, forgive my sins and help me not to do it again. These days I say, Lord, thank you for your forgiveness, but I'm likely to do it again unless you change me. I know what I'm like. Unless you change me. Do behave in accordance with your position. We are in position holy. In other words, become what you already are. Ephesians 4.1, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you've been called by God. Well, what is that calling for the first three chapters on Ephesians? You will not find a single command. It's full of, this is what you are, this is what you have. Wonderful truths. And then follows the next three chapters a lot of instructions. Often wonder what Prince William and Kate would say to their little children when they're about to go to Wimbledon or some public function. What do you think parents would say to children like that? Now, not behave yourself because all parents say that. What would they say? I'm guessing. But I think they would say, now children, remember who you are. Remember that you're royalty. And the implication is, behave like royalty. That's what God says to us. Remember who you are. Behave that way. And trust God to bring about the change in yourself. He will change you as you obey Him. We have this wonderful promise in Philippians 1.6. I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue His work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Joy, my wife, has a lovely saying that sometimes when she slips up, says, it's okay, I'm still under construction. And it's amazing at the change that God brings about in our lives, in our character, when we start obeying him in our behavior. Shall we pray? Our Father, we just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you that we don't have to struggle and we don't have to strive to change ourselves and we don't have to feel like failures. Lord, we acknowledge that we are so flawed. We acknowledge that there's no good that dwells in us. But thank you that as we just obey you from day to day, Lord, you change us and you make us more like yourself and you will be glorified in that way. Amen. Paul and his team are going to come up now to lead us in the final song. And then we're going to have the most important part of this church service. It takes place over there. And that's where you show kindness. And if there are newcomers to this, this morning here, if somebody doesn't talk to you, please, I can recommend, 
don't come back. 